Our scripture for this evening is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It is Pentecost. This weekend is Pentecost, and the definition of that is the day the church celebrates the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as we listen to the word of God, listen for that. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own language. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Are you impressed or what? I'm impressed. I'm impressed. <laughs> wow, wow. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> so what comes to mind when you think of the Holy Spirit? When you, when you just hear those words, actually, what comes to mind? Holy Spirit. It's going to be different things for different people. You know, is it a, is it a person? Is, is it a, a ghost? Is it a thing? Is it a fog? Is it a mist? Is it the air around you? Is it kind of nothing, because maybe you don't really think about the Holy Spirit much. You know, for some people, the Holy Spirit is the main event, the most important member of the Trinity. Um, Carolyn Langston, who is administrative assistant here uh, to Pastor Greg and to myself, uh, she's deeply faithful, and the Holy Spirit has always been her connection. She is very much aware of the Holy Spirit around all, all the time, and when she prays, she is praying to the Holy Spirit, and she is nudged by the Holy Spirit. She's not weird about it. She's just, that is, that is who she interacts with. You know, we can go to the other end of the spectrum, and I think for, for a lot of folks, the Holy Spirit's kind of an afterthought. You know, we're, we're to understand the Holy Spirit as a gift. But I wonder how many of us actually live our lives with this kind of full awareness of God, the Holy Spirit, with us all the time. How much of us really pay attention to that? And out of curiosity, when you pray, who do you direct your prayers to? Because there's no right or wrong to that. Absolutely none. You, you pray to any member of the Trinity, you get God the whole, the whole deal. You do. But, but it's interesting to think. Do you pray to God the Father or God the Mother or God the Creator? Do you pray to Lord Jesus or do you pray to the Holy Spirit? It's interesting to think about. Because probably not that many of us direct our prayers to the Holy Spirit when actually we're to believe it's the Holy Spirit who's with us all the time. When Jesus was preparing to leave this world, he told the disciples that they should actually be pleased he's going, which is a little hard to take, because that meant the Holy Spirit would come in his place and the disciples would be able to do even more than they could do at that time. But, you know, the disciples could experience Jesus through their, their human senses and can't do that with the Holy Spirit. And we tend to be so much more comfortable with the tactile because it's what we tend to identify as real. You know, we can touch and see and hear. And I think sometimes because of this, we have a tendency to give credit that belongs to the Holy Spirit to other things. 
Now, let me give you an example. Most of you have had spiritual experiences. It can be anything from, you know, you get goosebumps and it's, and this little, you're kind of moved to, to a life-transforming experience. We have experience, experiences of the Holy Spirit. And when you have those experiences in the midst of a particular church service, or it might happen in a class, or it might happen in a season of the church, or it could happen out in nature, or connecting with another human being, or through prayer, these things can happen anywhere. It's what uh, the author C.S. Lewis tended to uh, describe as surprised by joy. It's just this boom, you know, it's just this kind of, a kind of expansion in your chest that just sort of takes your breath away captures your full attention in that particular moment and in some way is transformational. And see, when that happens, that feels really good. And we want it again. We want it again and we want it again. It's a gift of awareness that appears to come out of nowhere. And so we have this very natural human tendency to start looking for a trigger. What caused that? Because we want to attribute that amazing experience of God to something, to something that we can recognize. So we tend to give the credit for that experience to maybe whatever was happening in that moment, rather than recognizing the Holy Spirit and giving credit to God. And let me give you an example. So I've shared this with you before, so I'm not going to go into detail, but in 1980, no, 1998 and 99, I was a layperson here, I loved the sense of community in this church. I had no idea what I thought about God. I had no knowledge of the Bible. And for a lot of reasons, I thought it was my responsibility, really, to learn some more. And so I took what's called Disciple Bible Study for a history lesson. That was the reason I took it. I wanted to be able to do a devotional in a a class that was beyond, you know, the Christmas and Easter story. That's That's why I took it. And Disciple Bible study, and there's, there's, there's different things offered now, but disciple still is offered. Disciple 1 is 34 weeks long. The first 17 weeks is the Old Testament. The second 17 weeks is the New Testament. You meet once a week for 34 weeks for two to two and a half hours, and six days a week there's homework to do that's been compared to drinking water from a fire hose. So I was going to make up a lifetime of never reading the Bible in 34 weeks, and I thought that would absolutely be the way to do it. Three-quarters of the way through, halfway through the New Testament lessons of it, I had what one of the associate pastors called an awakening. I, you know... I didn't know what it was, but it's like the lights came on, God became real to me, I didn't think this was possible, it's absolutely not what I was looking for, but see, it makes sense, because over those period of weeks, I was engaged in a spiritual practice of Bible study, of prayer, of meeting in class, and we know, we've talked about spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines. When you're engaged in that week after week after week, it prepares you to receive whatever the Holy Spirit would want to give to you. It was amazing. It changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. (laughs) And what happened at that point was that I became all about disciple Bible study. I mean, to the point of being obnoxious, right, Steve? All about (laughs) disciple Bible study. It had been so life transforming, you know? I became the ministry leader for disciple Bible study. and, And we would have announcements, like for three or four weeks in a row, in late summer because the classes took place over the school year. And so this was back before Pastor Greg, when Pastor Carl was still here. And I'd go in and I'd tell Pastor Carl, okay, we've got sign-ups for Disciple coming up, so I need time in your announcements. And he'd say, okay, two minutes. And I'd say, what? (laughs) Two minutes? And he'd say, we don't want to run long. And I'd say, who cares if we run 10 minutes long? This is Disciple Bible study. Heck, this is the reason most people even understand what you're talking about in your sermons, you know? (laughs) I mean, I was nuts. And he'd say, okay, three minutes. And I'd say, okay, (laughs) okay, I'll take the three minutes. So after probably an experience like that with me, I remember Pastor Carl saying, do you have time for a story? (laughs) Oh, I love stories. 
Yeah, tell me a story, Pastor Carl. So he said, there was this man taking a shortcut, walking through a field, because he was running late one day, when he fell into a deep, deep hole. I mean really deep, way too deep for him to climb out of it. And he cried out for help, but no one was near. And he knew nobody was going to look for him out there, so he had to figure out how to get out of this hole, or he was going to die. So he prayed. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. And while he was praying, he just kind of started digging, trying to climb out of this hole. And as he was digging, the dirt just fell down to where his feet were, and he stepped up on the dirt. And he kept praying, and he kept digging at the walls of this hole, and the dirt would fall down, and he'd step up. And he kept digging and praying and digging and praying, and he opened his eyes, and he was like, oh, I can get out. He got out. And in the process, he had this deep and powerful experience of God like he'd never had before. And he was aware that it was only because of God that he was out of that hole and safe again. And he knew his life had been saved and forever changed because of God in the midst of this experience. It was all-encompassing. It was everything to him. And it was all because he'd fallen in this hole. How strange. And he thought to himself, How can I possibly say thank you to God for all that God has done for me? And he thought, and he thought, and he thought, oh, I've got it. And from that point forward, he spent every day in that field, sitting next to that hole, waiting for anyone to come along so that he might push them in. (laughs) The end. I said, okay, I understand. (laughs) Disciple Bible study is my hole in the field. And he said, Bingo. It's like, okay. Bible study is a spiritual practice. When we practice a spiritual discipline, we prepare ourselves to receive whatever the Holy Spirit would have us receive. But when we start to give the spiritual practice credit for the grace received rather than the Holy Spirit, that's our hole in the field. Does that make sense? What's your hole in the field? Do you have one? Probably not to the extent I did. Your hole's probably smaller. See, the Holy Spirit will work through people, places, sermons, music, nature, experiences, prayer. The Holy Spirit will work through traditional worship, modern worship. What about this space, this chapel? We know how important this chapel is. When we were talking about you know, over a year ago, how we were going to grow this service because we were outgrowing one service and we knew that the options were two services on Saturday night, which is what we decided to do, or we could go to Fellowship Hall and we could do one service and grow up to 400. And for people who had been attending Saturday worship for a number of years, there were some pretty strong feelings about staying in this space. This space could be seen as a spiritual practice, a means of grace. And you know, when that's the reason for staying, and I think for most of us that is the reason for staying, that's fine. That's a nurturing thing. But if we ever got the thought that Saturday worship can only happen in this space and absolutely no other, that's our hole in the field. That's our hole in the field. We can get to a place where we find ourselves worshiping the space rather than the Holy Spirit who shows up for worship wherever you're at. Now, don't think because I said that we're moving to Fellowship Hall. We're not. We're not. I'm just giving you this as an example. Because we have a tendency to want to box in the Holy Spirit. We control things, we think, by our decisions. And really, you know, we don't. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan friar and just an internationally known uh, inspirational speaker and has published numerous books. If you've never read Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, I encourage you to. Um, His stuff is brilliant. And he writes uh, concerning the Holy Spirit, when we are threatened by anything that we cannot control, that part of God which blows where it will, and which our theologies and churches can neither predict nor inhibit. The Holy Spirit has rightly been called and 
the Holy Spirit has rightly been called the forgotten or denied person of the Blessed Trinity. We cannot sense the Spirit like we cannot see air, silence, and the space in between everything. We look for God out there when the Spirit is always in here and in between everything. So we get to our scripture today, and it's all about sensing the Holy Spirit. But I wonder if it's in a spiritual way or a literal way. When the day of the Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound, a sound like a rush of violent wind. Well, was it a sound that they heard in their ears, or was it a sound they heard in their spirit? And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues of fire appeared among them, appeared to their human eyes or spiritually. And a tongue of fire rested on each of them. A tongue of fire like they could feel? Or was it spiritually? And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. So there was transformation through this experience. We obviously see that. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, and at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in their own native language. They were amazed and astonished and asked, are not all of these speaking Galileans? Which means they should all be speaking the same language, but we're hearing them in our own language. We hear them speaking about God's deeds and powers. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, ah, they're filled with new wine. Ah, that's not real. They're drunk. Right? Why? Why are they saying that? Because what they were experiencing did not make sense. And this is another piece about having experiences of the Holy Spirit. Everything from little goosebumps during a hymn that moves you to a life-transforming experience. When you have those experiences, you tend to want to share them. And you want to share them with someone who will believe or at least want to understand your experience. But there are others who won't understand. They won't understand because they're simply not ready. And if you've tried to share a spiritual experience with somebody who's not ready, but they love you, you'll hear something like, well, I believe that's what you believe happened. <laughs> ah! I would encourage you when you have a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit that you're thoughtful about who you share it with, not just for your sake, but for theirs. When I am at the hospital for a prayer before surgery, there are times when we'll be praying and I get just waves of goosebumps and I am not chilly. And for me, that is a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I pray plenty of times where I don't get goosebumps and the Holy Spirit is absolutely there. It's just every once in a while I get this and it's like reassurance. I'm here, I'm always here, no, I'm always here. And depending on who I'm with, if I know that they will receive that in a way that's comforting, I will share. You know, I've got goosebumps all over. For me, that's a sign of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is all over this room. And for others, that would be a frightening thing to hear, right? So you're just careful because either way, the Holy Spirit's there, whether you announce it or not. Joan Chittister is an author of numerous books and a Benedictine nun. And she writes about the Holy Spirit. And then it, this moves into a prayer. And this is how we're going to finish up our sermon tonight. So Joan Chittister writes, The Holy Spirit embodies the life force of the universe, the power of God, the animating energy present in all things and captured by none. 
On this day of Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit of God, I invite you to pray with me. So let's be in an attitude of prayer. May the gifts of the Holy Spirit bring fire to the earth so that the presence of God may be seen in a new light, in new places, in new ways. May our own hearts burst into flame so that no obstacle, no matter how great, ever obstructs the message of God within each of us. May we come to trust the word of God in our heart, to speak it with courage, to follow it faithfully, and to fan it to flame in others. Amen. <laughs>